Good afternoon. Thanks for joining us. So this is CMP202, Scale Your Studio. And uh, I'm Chris Bond. I'm the founder of Thinkbox Software and acquisition by AWS in 2017. I am now the director of product and manage the uh, entertainment rendering workloads at AWS. I focus on simulation, content creation, production, and sort of any studio workflow. I have a personal goal um, of enabling the artist in small studios to scale and empower them to create new worlds, new content, new creative, and allow them to go home and visit their family occasionally, because that's a problem in visual effects. Um, <clears throat> my background is uh, in visual effects. I started a studio back in the 90s and uh, the team of experts in Winnipeg, Manitoba, Canada. And we scale that studio uh, pretty quickly. We're doubling at first every year and then faster. We opened a Vancouver office. We opened an office in Sydney, Australia and Los Angeles. And we had to build a distributed workflow back in the day. <laughs> and uh, that was a challenge without the cloud. And I, I can tell you right now, if I was building a studio from scratch, I would seriously consider all in on AWS as an option. And yesterday afternoon, a studio, Untold Studios, presented. And they're one of the first, as far as I know, the first all in visual effects production studio on AWS. But today, I'm going to talk about something uh, a little more dear to my heart, and that's scaling your studio. So I'm going to touch on these ideas of how to render at scale. Um, I'm going to look at some customer trends that we've been seeing, some unexpected results uh, based on um, what we thought we would see. Um, we're going to talk a bit about infrastructure, software. I'm going to touch on workstations, because this is the sort of new thing to bring your whole studio to the cloud and scale your workstations. And finally, we have Jason Fodder here from FuseFX, who's a CTO and co-founder. And we're going to bring him up on the stage to talk about how their studio is scaling with AWS. So I'm just going to jump in on, on a, a, a uh, simple topology. It's sort of simplified a little bit, but the idea is, is I want to talk about hybrid rendering. So a hybrid studio is one where we consider where you have on-premise infrastructure that you want to continue to use, and I totally understand that. A lot of the, whether you're a small studio or a large company with thousands of machines, you want to keep using those. What, what I like to say is, you know, there's a lot of industries where they have an outsized influence on compute and simulation and storage, and visual effects companies are that way. I, I encounter a lot of companies that have far more compute than Fortune 500 or larger companies, and there's like 30 people in a room, and I think that's fantastic. So a hybrid infrastructure is one where you're working with your on-prem infrastructure, you're continuing to render and work with it, but you're also scaling to AWS. And so in August of last year, we launched Deadline 10 with a product called AWS Portal, and that allows you to connect directly to AWS. It sets up an infrastructure for you and lets you launch what we call Spot on AWS. And these are your render nodes that you're going to be using on the cloud. It's like I said, sort of an overview of how this might connect. And the idea here is that we wanted to allow people to essentially uh, work in a way that's like AWS delivering a whole bunch of machines to your facility and taking them away when they're done. That was our aim and goal. Now, I get a bunch of questions about what exactly is Spot and why is it the best choice for rendering. So I'm going to jump in for a second and describe the various instance types that we have on AWS. <clears throat> so if you're not familiar, and I'm sure most of you are, but if you're not, I'm going to go over this really quickly. We have on-demand instances, and these are instances that are essentially what you would expect from the cloud. They're machines that are yours for a period of time. You turn them on, you turn them off. Reserved instances are machines that are yours for 24-7, and you've committed to those for a year to three years, and that's kind of like a machine that you would have in AWS that you own. You would specify what that machine is. I mean, you don't own it, but it's a machine that you have access to whenever you want. It's a committed machine. 
spot is AWS's spare capacity. And <clears throat> the advantage to you is that it is almost, it can be up to 90% off the cost of an on-demand instance. The disadvantage is that it can be recalled by users as required who require on-demand. Fortunately, you get a two-minute warning. So in a traditional business, if you look at a studio and apply sort of how a visual effects studio might work, you use RIs for sort of your, your, your steady state infrastructure, you know, your database, your production assets you want to keep online all the time and access. You would um, use on-demand, and you can mix these up, but I, I would see on-demand as really a workstation, you know, when you want to scale your artists, when you want to add people in another region, you want to bring them on for 15 hours a week, 50 hours a week, and you can turn those machines on and off. And then Spot is really the rendering or compute. It's machines that you're just gonna burst and scale up a whole infrastructure and then scale it back down. Now, if you're, you have to look at your business and how you operate. I mean, some companies need, you know, might need 100 machines 90% of the time, you know? Although when I look at on-premise data, people who say, oh, our render machines are busy 100% of the time, it's really more like 85, 80%, and which is really good, because in other industries, it's like 40% or 35%. But in visual effects, people do tend to use the machines more frequently. <clears throat> so how do you access those instances? So in Deadline 10, this is the on-premise monitor. So this is deployed on a laptop, on a physical machine, on your computer. The artist has access to this, and we have a panel that basically access, accesses AWS directly. You have your credentials, and you can launch an infrastructure. And they show up as part of your on-premise fleet, essentially. So you have a whole bunch of instances that can render your job, that combine with your on-prem, so you can actually mix tasks if you want to. Some companies split jobs to the cloud, some, some companies actually have their on-premise and cloud machines collaborate on a single job. We had a customer recently that had, I believe, 16K frames. They were taking a long time to render. They didn't have enough capacity on-premise, so they add AWS, but they're continuing to render with those machines on the same task. So <clears throat> the thing to remember about Spot is it's the same instances. We have a lot of different instance types. So we have customers that occasionally get you know, P3s, which are very expensive at Spot rates. Now, those are really sought after, <laughs> so it's less likely, but it can happen. So there's a lot of different instance types. The price is 70% is 90% off. What's interesting is, a year ago, we announced a, a, that Spot has changed from a bidding. So it originally used to bid against other people, and so you could get interrupted by someone that bid higher than you. That's gone. That's been gone for a year. And so now, we essentially, we manage the market really slowly over time. I believe we don't update price more than once a day. And we do it to guide people to certain instance types and families that we have a lot of capacity on. And we have a lot of capacity. We have customers who are spinning up a million cores at a time, 60,000 plus instances, and they're doing this by diversifying their fleet. And I'll talk a bit about more later about what that means. <clears throat> so when I say that people can take back the instances because of on-demand consumption, people get concerned about interruptions. Are my renders gonna get interrupted all the time? Am I gonna lose my work? And what's really interesting is a lot of our customers aren't seeing that. And we looked at the data, and what we found was, in the last three months, 95% of instances shutting down were because the user wanted to shut them down. And this includes all of the instance types. We're not just picking and choosing. And there are instances, like I said, that are really attractive, and ones that just aren't as attractive, especially nights and weekends when people tend to render the bulk of their visual effects production work. So, <clears throat> as well, there's a, uh, a feature that launched last year called Hibernate. And Hibernate, if you flag that when you launch a spot fleet, will actually cache in memory the state of your, your uh, work so that you can resume it later when capacity becomes available. So people can take advantage of that for something like a 24-hour, 48-hour render if they're really concerned about it, about losing it midstream, like a simulation or something. This is milk. So I like to talk about milk because 
This is the kind of customer that last year I tried to predict, but I was completely wrong. <laughs> <laughs> so last year, and I'm going to get to some, some graphs on this, but last year I told my boss what kind of work we could expect from customers on the cloud, what kind of elasticity people wanted to see, what I estimated you know, after the acquisition. Because I'd worked in production, and I thought, oh, this is what people are going to do. And, and Milk is one of the perfect examples of how they proved us wrong. So Milk is a small team of artists that worked on this project called Adrift this past year. It's a feature film with a lot of fluid simulation and water. And very complicated shots with actors interacting as their boat sinks. And the director had a lot of this vision of this like really in your face shots that were very difficult. And so this little studio, I mean not little, but these small team of folks scaled up their infrastructure using AWS because they had to. They essentially went 9x what they had on-prem. And they're London-based, and if you know anything about London, you probably know they didn't have a lot of space to even house those computers, let alone cooling or electricity. So the only way this could have been done is by using the elasticity of the cloud. So they scaled up to over 130,000 cores at peak, averaging 80,000 cores every single day. They did this with deadline. <clears throat> And they um, were successful, and they were super happy. And now they're a continuing customer. Because once you experience that scale, when you have an issue or challenging production, it sort of becomes now a de facto tool that the artists can use when you need to iterate faster or do more work. So let me talk about those customer trends that I, I looked at. So we have these great customers that gave us some data from their on-prem infrastructure so we can look at how they're using on-prem render farm. And this is a customer, it's a small studio, a boutique. This is a period of five days, and the vertical is 24 hours. And so these are the renders that they're doing. So pretty sy systematically, they're launching renders. As they get close to production, the renders are getting longer and longer. There's plenty of renders there that are taking 24 hours. So when I spoke to Joshua, about what kind of work we could see in finance and people like that. It was like, oh, these, th these jobs are going to come to the cloud, right? They're going to bring the work that they want to see a little faster the next day, et cetera. So, you know, we're going to get about 5%, 10% growth. Then we looked at a larger studio. So this is another studio. The vertical is in 48 hours, and this is one day of submissions. So this studio... <laughs> is waiting two to three days before their artists can review on a lot of assets. So whether it's simulations, it's fire, it's explosions, buildings crashing, characters running through fields with you know, millions of other characters, or whatever it is, that's how long these things were taking on their on-prem infrastructure. And so they had a fixed infrastructure. So I, so I looked at that and I said, okay, well, what are they gonna send? Well, they're definitely going to send the stuff that's over 24 to 48 hours. So they're going to need to scale their infrastructure like that extra peak. And, and what really is happening, and this is what I told Joshua, <clears throat> what's really happening, the trend that we're seeing is that customers are consistently scaling 2x, 5x, even 10x their on-prem infrastructure like milk. Whether it's a small studio with 30 machines, they're going to 500 because they can because it, it's the same amount of cost to render on 500 machines in parallel at per second billing <laughs> as it is to scale 100 machines and wait five times longer. So they're changing how they work. And so if we look at this particular data set, I can push every job down to two hours. That's the bottom graph. So everything's gonna take less than two hours, half an hour, an hour. Every artist can be more responsive simply by scaling the infrastructure. And that's the vertical lines at the top. So the artist can spend more time creating, you get things done faster, you're iterating faster, and the cost is the same as if you just waited and had everything render on the cloud within a reasonable time. So in this particular example, that's adding 23,000 cores for a 24-hour period. So they're scaling, and that's changing their business. So customers are able to say yes. So our customers are telling us, we're able to take on more projects, 
We're able to compete better. The director's happier. Instead of saying like, oh, I don't know about that change in shot for the trailer for the Super Bowl, they're like, yes, and here's how we're gonna do it. And the interesting thing, like I said, is time becomes this elastic thing now. When do you want it? Add more cores. So to get to that kind of scale, I mentioned this earlier, you wanna do something called diversify your spot fleet request. And the reason why you wanna do this, and, and, I, and I see this, is that people like, they tend to test, they find an instance they like that sort of matches or is faster than what they have on-prem. And they're like, oh yeah, I need 64 gigs of RAM, and here's this MC59 XL, and this is perfect. And then they're like, let's ask for 1,000 C59 XLs, or 2,000 or something in their fleet request. But the reality is, is we have a lot of instance types. And there's instance types that have been announced, more being announced at the show, but like the C5D is not even on here. You know, there's a whole class of instances that will fit the job that you have. So what I, what I, what I see in the customers that are successful in scaling is they're looking at the instances that will fit, they're looking at the requirements of their project or their job, but more importantly, they're also considering like, when do I want it? This is the elastic thing. Like, do you need it in two hours? Do you want it in, in, by tomorrow morning? How many instances do you want to scale up to? So adjusting your fleet request. And what's interesting is, you know, I talk to um, customers who are, I, I see the instances they're doing, they're like, oh, we want a lot of RAM. So they're using like the R's. I even see people who have like picked I and other instances like that. So, you know, that might sound complicated. There's an API to request all of those through Spot, but we've actually made it right in the interface in Deadline 10. So we have little default buttons that let you pick like small, medium, large instance types. If you want GPU only, all the GPUs, tagging like G2, G3s, and then you can select, drag and drop what they are. You can see the price right in the interface, in the region, et cetera, that you're in. So, scaling. Tons of machines, you got a lot of render, a lot of cores, you know, 500 GPUs to get your Redshift render done. That's great. What about everything else? And this is the thing that kind of has been a learning experience for all of us, because a lot of customers, you know, we look at them and we sort of rank them in terms of size, like, oh, this is a small, medium, large, or this is a boutique, this is a studio. And, and, and I'm pitching this idea that, hey, you could have a thousand machines, and people are taking us up on it. They're scaling, but they have an infrastructure they designed for those five or 10 or 50 machines, and they can literally go to a thousand in a minute. And so they have, you, we all have to understand we have to scale our infrastructure and scale our software. So in a hybrid rendering pipeline, which is the same graph from earlier, we are, uh, in deadline 10, we are synchronizing and handling your assets for you. And the way that works is a user submits the job, Maya, Max, the scene introspection, grabs a list of those assets, synchronizes them up securely, we do a multi-part transfer to S3, 2048-bit um, uh, encryption, uh, it goes up to your deadline 10 infrastructure. We store a database that lists all the assets that you synchronize up so they don't have to resync assets as they change. They're stored on S3, and every time you spin up an instance, that S3 asset is copied to a local EBS on Linux onto that machine so the local render node has access to all of the assets. And so this works really well for a small, medium-sized boutique studio to scale up and build their infrastructure, but some, everybody has varying needs and also varying projects. So to that end, we also support our partner solutions. So Deadline 10 has built-in asset synchronization, but you can build a pipeline by partnering with folks like Cumulo or Weka. So Cumulo has Windows and Linux support for hybrid pipelines where you wanna have both. And Weka.io is a company that focuses on high performance to things like single nodes. So if you have a situation where you're at seven gigabytes per second to a single instance, you could do that. And this is what I try to explain to people. It's like, you don't have to just live out of the box with a certain thing. You can experiment, and that's what AWS makes that very easy to experiment. You can scale up these instances. We're partnered with these folks. We can get Weka up and running with people pretty quickly. <coughs> 
And so the, 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 the choice is really up to you to experiment. And what I say to people is like, don't wait until you're in that situation where the director's like, you know, we need these water shots to be even crazier and you gotta redo them or whatever on a Friday night at five in the morning. What we like to do is have people experiment, get on the cloud early, get connected, do a POC with us, proof of concept. They can test and evaluate their workflow and then they're ready if disaster strikes or an opportunity arises. The other part is scaling your software. So one of the challenges we have is that the software partners have been a little slower to move to a on-demand or, or per minute, per second licensing model for their software. So we built a system called usage-based licensing. And it sits on top of an existing software uh, application license technology. So they don't have to change or do anything. So it's a pretty minimal move for for a partner to come into our marketplace. So we built the Thinkbox marketplace, and in that marketplace, you can, you can license software uh, uh, from us in, in sort of quantities of hours, and then use them on a per minute basis on those machines. So you can have 1,000 machines running for one minute each. You can access V-Ray and Clarice and Arnold and a bunch of different tools if you need to. So we've added this so that people can also scale their licensing and not have to go buy a year subscription to 1,000 seats of Nuke or something, right? In addition to this, we've also built default Amazon machine images. So right inside the deadline interface, you can choose through AWS portal, default AMIs, that's what we call Amazon machine image, in case you hear the word AMI. I don't know why it's not AMI, but AMI is how we, <laughs> we talk about it. And you can use our default either as a template to test to deploy your own plugins and other external products on, or you could start with your own instance completely, and you can, uh, you can pick that instance ID right inside the interface. So you can choose the instances that you want, you can modify them, we give them out of the box. And these will work with your own licenses as well as our uh, per minute licensing. So you can combine those, and we actually have a licensing system that will track the consumption and usage so that your you limit the number of concurrent machines if you only want to use your own licenses, and, or you can combine with um, use-based licensing. We'll always, always prefer your own licenses first and foremost. So <clears throat> I'm going to talk, this is going to be a quick overview of workstations, but I want to talk about how workstations are evolving and changing and how and why I think the experience is new. And the first thing I'll point out is we have these G3 instances. And here's the specs. So currently we have a G, there's actually one I'm missing here now because it's been announced recently, but a G3 4 extra large, G3 8, and a G3 16. And there's a G3 small now, G3S, I believe. And this is a, <coughs> your computer graphics workstation. But if you notice, the RAM and the number of CPUs change. And this is what... I've described to people about the scale. It's like an artist could be on a shot, start running out of RAM, and everything goes really slow. If you've been in Macs or Maya or AutoCAD or any of those products, running out of RAM is a really bad thing. And so you can shut that machine down, and within minutes, have another instance up with double the RAM or double the core count so the artist can work. So you can scale the interactive use of your artist as well. Excuse me. And I wanted to talk about latency, because the first thing people say is, well, remote workstations are a challenge for us because of latency and the artists complain and the, the whack -em. And here's something that like, we've been, it's all been learning, we've been learning. And I had this great discussion with this, with this team that focused on testing latency and performance and how people use the computers. They had a lot of studies with people that were, that were using them, and there's this, this sort of misleading thing about total latency. You know, when we talk about the latency to a region or a data center, that's just the additional latency on top of it. So if we look at, for example, Los Angeles to, to um, SFO, that's US West, it's 11 milliseconds in a direct connect. Now, depending on the monitor you use, you could be adding more than that to your latency. So the all-in studio, untold, 
experimented with monitors to find the one that had the lowest latency so they didn't have additional latency overhead. So what I guess what I'm saying is the artist could be working in a situation where if they change the monitor and your remote, your overall latency is actually lower and your experience can be the same or better. So there's driver, graphics card, your monitor, all of that adds latency. So, so people said to me like, oh, we tried this years ago. <laughs> and now we're trying them. So at the, at the at two things I'm gonna say. The first is at SIGGRAPH this last year at our booth, we ran at 30 to 40 millisecond latency a, a workstation and we allowed people to play with Houdini, Max, Maya, and paint programs like Photoshop. And what was really interesting about that experience is that we had artists from studios that have, have their own remote desktops internally, and they said, this is a better experience than I have at my studio. And they were actually able to paint, and people were kind of like pivoting, like, this is really interesting. And we walked away from that with literally dozens of studios saying, we need to do a POC on workstations. And I think the technology has evolved where we're at that place. And the reason why I really like that is because a studio starts to look a lot different when you have all of your workstations virtualized. So all you need is your artist, an internet connection, direct connect would be the most superior option, um, and a zero client or a thin client or a desktop machine, and then you can access a virtual infrastructure, a virtual machine of any size and scope. So I have this vision of artists working from remote locations, working from home, and everybody having a better experience than they currently do. And I think that's the change that's coming because right now the barrier is it's, it's, a, it's worse for the artists. And I think we're transforming that and it's gonna, we're gonna make it better for them. And what it, what it also does is it transforms how people work because now you can scale the workstation but you're also scaling the infrastructure around it. And so remember when I said like WEC.io and Cumulo are these new cloud-based file systems? Well, you can dial up and down the performance of those on demand. So depending on what the artist is doing or the challenge that they have, you know, whether it's a massive simulation, you're building like, you're at Fosters and Partners, you're building a giant building, an architect, you're working in visual effects, doing fluid simulation, or 16K renders for um, uh, of Las Vegas film ride, which customers are doing. You can actually do those things on machines you could never spec out on-prem. I mean, we have machines with terabytes of RAM, and tons of storage, and you can scale your storage so it's super fast. And so I say to the studios, I'm like, when's the last time you upgraded your network infrastructure? How are you gonna like double, you know, every day at 3 p.m. at my studio, people would say, it is slow. <laughs> and in my office, they come up, there's something wrong with the network at three, and it's just, everybody was submitting their work to the farm at the same time, they're all hitting the, the servers, there's no way for us to dial that up and down, and you could do so within minutes. And so that transforms it, and there's also the data and security. It's all on the cloud, all of your data's there, people can be in all these different locations, and you worry a lot less about how do we get them the data, where does it go? So it transforms a lot of the work. And I, <clears throat> I'm gonna stop there, because I stole a bunch of those slides from uh, Mike Owen, and he's doing a uh, workstation event tomorrow afternoon, it's a full two hour session where you can actually sit down and you're gonna build a virtual workstation and you're gonna go through the whole experience with him. So that's tomorrow afternoon. I'm really excited about this. We have, if you're interested, there's a blog post. We have um, an AMI with drivers and best practices on how to set this up yourself. So. Talked a lot about scale and studios and work, so I think I'm gonna do two things. First off, I'm gonna introduce Jason Fodder from FuseFX, CTO and co-founder, but first, I'm gonna play some of their work and play the reel right now.
Thank you. There we go. Hi, I'm Jason Fodder. Thank you, Chris. Uh, CTO, co-founder of Fuse Effects. Uh, a little intro to our company. We're an award-winning visual effects facility. Um, we focus on visual effects for episodic television. Approximately 350 employees across three locations, Los Angeles, New York, and Vancouver. And in 2018, we will touch or work on you know, about 110 different projects. So we have lots of work coming through the facility and a, you know, a very tremendous workload at times, which is why we are leveraging the cloud. And I'm going to talk to you today about some in innovative and creative ways that the cloud is helping us manage these workloads at, at really an unprecedented pace. Some trends that we're seeing in television, I, I don't think it's any surprise. There's more content than ever be before being generated. I was just talking last night about the previous model of television was you would there would be an air date, an air time for your favorite TV show. That would be every week, every two weeks, and you'd have to you know, wait for the next week to see the next episode. And that process would go September through May on a traditional season. Those still happen. We still have shows like that. But we also have content being created that's released on Netflix, Amazon, others. That is full 13 episodes all at once, and you can literally watch the whole season in one day in your living room. And people do that. So now you've consumed a whole season in a single day, and now you need more to watch. And so this is driving this tremendous amount of content being created in media and entertainment. And uh, for companies like Fuse FuseFX, it's more work for us, which is a good thing. Um, but it's challenging. You need to get it done quickly. And you need to be able to scale to support these various things. The other thing that is changing. 4K and HDR are the new normal. Last year, we were still holding on to some HD-related shows. Those are gone uh, for the most part. And 4K is here, high dynamic range. So we're dealing with bigger resolution, more dynamic range in our images, more storage, more processing, more, 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 more. And also, our clients want even better visual effects. What was last year is boring and they want new stuff this year. They want to push the limits. They want to you know, push us to the, to the brink and beyond of what we're capable of doing, but not give us any more time. And then I, uh, a little interesting uh, stat, I, 77 total brands producing original content right now, uh, and that's probably increasing tomorrow. A little background of Fuse Effects. We started in 2008, myself, Tim Jacobson, and Dave Altineau. One of the things we focused early on was creating an efficient workflow within visual effects. Um, I don't know if, if any of you are familiar with visual effects, but it's an incredibly inefficient process. There are multiple steps. There's changes. It's a creative process. Every step has iterations. It can be really complicated, really time consuming, and become a mess really, really fast. So we set out in the beginning to, to compartmentalize each step, automate it where we could, create a proprietary production platform to monitor and track all these things. And what we found that is gave us more time to focus on the creative, more time to do what we really needed to do and create those amazing images that you see in that reel. So we did pretty good at that. We started growing. 2012 was a really a big growth year for us. In 2014, we opened offices in New York and Vancouver. That was when I realized that we needed to develop a system to synchronize files between offices. So that began uh, within our Nucleus platform. We started to develop logic to synchronize files. And that's become a really uh, big catalyst for why we've been able to leverage a cloud so well. In 2015, we were full. In 2016, we moved all offices in a summer. That was really fun. Uh, in 2017, last year, I did a presentation and talked about how we were heavily using the cloud. We're doing more and more and more of that. And now in 2018, we're looking at our next phase of growth. We're looking to grow each office. We're looking at more locations, strategic locations, to better service our clients, and really just getting ready for this content that's being created in the industry. So Chris mentioned a little bit 
about the challenges of a studio like Milk. Uh, we face those same challenges. Um, so I have offices in New York and Vancouver. They're smaller than LA. And they're in buildings that are not the greatest with relation to power and cooling. Uh, when I went to our Vancouver studio, uh, the, the owners of our Vancouver building and said, I need another 30 kW of power and cooling, they looked at me and they were like, no way. So when we have more projects, we need to add more people. We can do that. We can hire people. We can bring them in. We can load them up with a computer, put software on their machine, get them up and running. That's not too much of a problem. But the challenge with something like this is now we need more render power because more people, more projects is more rendering. And that's where we look to the cloud. And that's where we burst. And because we're able to seamlessly transition into rendering in the cloud, it's not so much of a problem anymore. This is a diagram of our infrastructure and how we're doing it. So on the, your right hand side, my left, you'll notice we have traditional file system, Isilon cluster, local, a local render farm. We were a deadline customer. And like I said, we have our nucleus production management system that manages all the assets for any particular render job. And at any moment in time, we can say, push this job to the cloud. On the cloud, we run a Cumulo cluster. And I'll talk a little bit more, uh, a little bit later in my presentation about how we've been scaling that as well. Uh, we have a custom AMI that matches our local Windows uh, images so that when we spin up these spot fleets and spot instances in the cloud, they're an exact match and they have the proper version of V-Ray, the proper version of Max, et cetera, so that the resulting image that comes back is what we expect. The last thing we want to do is burst into the cloud or render at all and get a bad image out. It happens, but we try to avoid it. What we've done in 2018 is we've replicated this across all offices. Last year was a little more focused in LA, but what we've done due to limitations primarily in, in our New York and Vancouver offices is we've just taken this, we've plugged Nucleus into there, and we can do this from any office at any given moment in time. Really powerful, really exciting, and, and really allows us to just not be afraid of any kind of workload that might come through the facility. And something I'm really excited about in Vancouver is they uh, use Maya more predominantly than 3D Studio Max, and Maya supports Linux, so we're going to be taking advantage of Linux in instances in the cloud and take advantage of those cost savings there. And that's all really easy to do in the cloud because it's just create a different AMI, spin that up instead of a Windows instance, really flexible, really, really seamless. Here's our usage in August and September of 2018. It's our largest usage to date. It's about one and a half times last year. Last year, I spoke about this funny little moment where we had trouble on, a, on, a, on an overnight render, and we came in the morning, and it was a bit of a scary situation, and we were able to burst in the cloud and save the day, and it was really amazing and really awesome. It wasn't that amazing to go through that because it was really scary. So I'm proud to say we didn't have that moment this year. But what we had was a tremendous amount of volume come through the facility, and we were able to manage it very well because we were able to burst, because we were able to scale on demand at any given moment and get through that work. I put this little graphic up there at that largest time, about 22,000 hours in a 24-hour period. That equates to about 929 machines. That's about 3x of our local farm. But that would be impossible to do. There's no possible way that I could bring that many machines into any infrastructure that I have and get them up and running in a matter of minutes. And I'm able to do that on the cloud. I'd like to focus a little bit on a particular project we worked on. This is a, an interesting and fun project to talk about. 911 is a, a television show that takes place in Los Angeles. It's about first responders, firefighters, and police officers, and how they respond to various things in their day-to-day -day lives and, and um, you know, 
what is involved with doing their job, really interesting storylines. So of course, what do you write into the script? You write an earthquake episode. We're all in LA. What's interesting about this show is this is a, this is a challenging show for us because it's a very fast paced schedule. Every two weeks, they don't lock the cut till the last minute. They deliver us our shots and we have maybe a week and a half to get them finalized. A show like this will have a traditional pattern of, of, of size relating to budget and number of shots. That th this earthquake episode was about five times the amount of their normal episodes, but they didn't give us any more time. So taking on a project like this and being surprised uh, and having little time to plan is why the cloud is so powerful in our environment. You know, you have three weeks, 187 shots, 30 of them are CG. We had to replace an existing hotel. There were many long shots. Chris talked about rendering and wait times. You know, 500 frames at 24 frames a second is a very long shot. That can be very challenging in our environment just to work on, to render, to, to, to review, to, to iterate. And so you need to process through this stuff very quickly. And so I'm going to uh, load up a little reel here and show you some of the work that we did. Thank you. So that's just a few shots of uh, about 187, and all of that was done in three weeks' time. It, it's mind-boggling that we can actually do that. I'd like to transition a bit and talk about storage for VFX. Um, you know, the cloud and compute and these massive workloads and spot instances and, and, and the scale that we can achieve is pretty amazing and, and powerful. What you have to focus on, especially in the world of visual effects, is developing storage systems to support that. VFX is a file-based workflow. We deal with files, we deal with file systems, and those file systems have to be large. They have to support a massive amounts of IOPS and throughput, and you want your render machines to be as close to your storage as possible so latency becomes uh, something you have to keep in mind when developing this kind of infrastructure. When we talk about cloud systems, what's exciting is the ability to scale this type of system in an elastic way to support varying workloads. Um, and it's something that 
is really foundational to supporting this type of system. I'd like to talk about our use of Cumulo and how we were able to transition uh, and relate this to uh, an issue we had uh, on premise and, and, and how just really important and impressive I think it is when we talk about scaling workloads in the cloud. So when we started with Cumulo, we had four M416X large instances and we were running with magnetic EBS volumes. We had, we could achieve about 30K IOPS and three gigs a second. That was pretty good. We were, we were feeling good about that. That was more than uh, we had done uh, before in the cloud and that was, you know, serving us pretty well for a period of time. When you run across August and September of 2018, and you have more and more and more usage and you're scaling your workloads to even larger, that setup wasn't cutting it anymore. So we call up the Cumulo team, we're like, we need a faster cluster in the cloud. Okay, no problem. Here's, a, here's an instance, where, where do we wanna go? And so we landed on, okay, let's go with six instances, let's go to, go to SSD on EBS, let's uh, and achieve about 80K IOPS and 15 gigs a second. We did that in about 24 hours. Contrary to this scenario, in New York, on our Iceland cluster, on premise, we had an instance where the render farm was maxing out the throughput of the cluster. Physical machines in a rack, kind of set in stone, immovable objects, and a render farm that's just hammering it. And I can't do anything about it. I, I, I can't make the storage go faster. If I could, I would. So the answer was to throttle the render farm. It wasn't a moment, it was a particular job that I couldn't transfer to the cloud. I wish I could, because I would if I could have, but I couldn't. And so to tell artists, to tell productions, sorry, we're gonna have to throttle your render tonight so that people aren't experiencing massive slowdowns is not a great answer. It doesn't get shots done on time, it doesn't, make people feel good, it makes people work long hours, incurs more overtime, it affects the creative process because you can't get through enough iterations to get the shot right. It's just not, not a great scenario. Transition to cloud, slow storage, not cutting it, 24 hours, now we have faster storage, it's all virtual, it's all great, we can run massive workloads. If we needed to double, triple, or quadruple that, I'm sure we could. Um, it, it really is a paradigm shift on how you think about infrastructure and how you think about visual effects and the workloads we're doing and what the cloud means. And it's really exciting to be able to talk about that. It's really exciting to say we've done it. And when you have these problems on-prem and you realize the pain of them, you feel like that's an archaic kind of workflow and not something we want to keep long-term. So in looking kind of more future related, we're looking at ways to have maybe multiple Cumulo clusters in the cloud that are backed by S3, can support varying workloads for varying projects and be just this kind of virtualized infrastructure that can support any workload. So you have to say we have a small project that doesn't require a lot of throughput, isn't gonna be a massive amounts of rendering. I don't need to throw a massively flat, fast cluster at that project, and on the flip side, if I have got a massive project, I don't want to be underperformant. So to wrap it up, what's next for a company like Fuse? The first thing on this list I put down is the challenge of syncing files. So we're able to do this, we do it pretty well, we do it efficiently, but it's hard. It's hard to, to manage a lot of data, and it's hard to transfer that data around efficiently. And so what Chris was alluding to is the next step to not have to do that is to have workstations in the cloud. So we're looking at that, and we're looking at ways to leverage a hybrid approach and have workloads that make sense where we can run those workstations in the cloud and not have to worry about transferring files all over the place. It's really exciting. I think it, in, in, in the future it's gonna be a no-brainer and it's gonna be something we talk about. Oh, remember when we had local infrastructure? Ha, 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 how, how, how silly were we? It's gonna take some time to get there and we're, we're, we're testing that and, and, and getting ready to do it. The other thing we're looking at is AI and machine learning. There's lots of um, 
talk and, 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 and information out there with things like recognition about image-based uh, analysis, what we're looking at is our massive data set in Nucleus. We've got 10 years of really, really strong data and how we can leverage that for things in an AI world. I uh, envision a world where we have a slew of render, no, uh, render jobs on the farm and we can predict to the second how long it's going to take and how many instances we need to spin up and how much we need to scale to hit a target of delivery. Like I said, virtualized infrastructure presents new ideas to us, new ways of thinking, new, new, new ways to set things up. You know, if you think about a traditional VM and your ability to spin down that VM, add some more RAM to it, spin it back up, and now, now you're good. That's the kind of things that we're looking at a larger scale with our entire infrastructure. Being able to change a cumulo cluster out like that within a 24-hour period is similar to that. Other things, like if you're on workstations, we have artists that will consume RAM, like it's water. And a 256 gig RAM machine for them is like, eh. Now, if you're running a local workstation, you gotta see if you have the right RAM, you gotta put it in, do you have enough slots, is it gonna work? Who knows? If you're running workstations on the cloud, Okay, spin it down, spin up another one, run like that for whenever you need to. When you're done, spin that down, bring up your standard workstation, you're off and running. And then we are anticipating the need to be global as a visual effects company to service our clients. So existing in multiple locations, maybe around the world, doubling down on the locations we have, making them run as efficient and smooth as possible, all supporting this global system of synchronization and processing and storage, and, and really that's what the cloud is for us and, and, and where we're looking. So thank you. That's a little bit of Fuse and what we're doing, and appreciate taking the time. Thanks, Jason. Appreciate that. That's great. So, <clears throat> So I'm going to conclude this with a couple of thoughts. So one of the things are, you know, we're all learning. And, and what I mean by that is, you know, uh, AWS is adding a ton of new features and services every year. Last year was over 1,430 new features and services. We're adding them at a, a compelling, fast rate. And every day there's new things that we're learning about how people want to work, how they're scaling their infrastructure, what they're doing with their studio. And, and I, I think it's really an ongoing challenge for all of us. So what I wanted to say, a couple of last words were, think about the kind of work that you're doing, the kind of projects you have, and where AWS might help. Reach out to us. Do a POC so you're ready. You know, we constantly have customers who are painting themselves into that corner that I say, where essentially you've you know, done 150 terabytes of simulation on-prem, and now you need to like render it, it's taking 48 hours a frame, it's not gonna get done, and you call us and go, can I move this stuff to the cloud and get it done in two days? And you're like, you know, snowball, there's options, but it's just the timing can be really difficult. If they had simulated on the cloud, there would be no corner, right? You're constantly able to scale. When you're gonna use the spot instances, you want to, to diversify your fleet, access all of those sweet instances that we have, all the different various ones. Don't just get focused, hyper-focused on a specific type and so that you can scale to those. You know, we have this thing at, um, I'm in the spot org, and uh, there's kind of a challenge, like what's the biggest workload? So we talked about, you know, millions of cores. So I want to see a visual effects company scale to say five million cores. Maybe Jason next year, we can talk about that. Yeah. And as Jason, you know, alluded, and, and, I, and, I, and I discussed, or I alluded to, and then he actually discussed an example, scaling your infrastructure as well. And think about that and how can it affect your artists and get work back faster, how you can iterate faster, how your machines and render nodes could, could process faster, save you money. And of course, looking at virtual workstations. And so I have an update on the virtual workstations. My slide was out of date. So the virtual workstations is Thursday at 11.30. So uh, check that out. And uh, that's it. I think we're done. Thanks for coming. Don't forget to fill out your uh, session survey. And uh, have a great afternoon.